All right, guys, welcome back to today's episode of Wondercast. I'm very excited for um, our guest today. We have Mike Vizar with Bizarre Solutions here. Okay. He's up in the house. So I'm uh, just going to get to pick his brain a little bit about how he got started, what they do. They, they do a lot of cybersecurity related stuff. Or, so we're going to go into a little bit of that. But yeah, I'll turn it over to Mike. Tell us a little bit about yourself, sir. Yeah, so um, about me or business or both? But we can start with you personally, and yeah. then you tell us a little bit about how you're here and what got you here. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the short version of the long story was, um, you know, basically grew up here. Um, I'm a Yankee originally, but okay. we, we moved here pretty quick. So okay. upstate New York, not the city. Okay. Uh, moved here, went through high school here, went to school in Colorado. Actually got a mechanical engineering degree, okay. but um, I was always just a nerd. And so I moved back to Lubbock after I graduated trying to find a job because I didn't want to do like CAD drawings all day. I mean, sure. like I want to do design and engineering and robotics. Like that was interesting to me. And I kind of fell into IT. Okay. And uh, so I started doing it as a sole proprietor and did that for a while. And then um, my brother is a part owner of a company. They do big wireless networks and uh, and endpoints. They, they're called for uh, mining. Okay. So I spent four years doing service and sales for um, these big, big multinational you know, Newmont and Barrick and all these really big gold mining, coal mining companies traveling all over the U.S. and, and whatnot. And um, my record was I drove 7,000 miles in one month. Jeez. Yeah. And, uh, and then we had our first kid. And okay. I was like, I, I don't want to keep doing this. Can't do that anymore. <laughs> and so that was the end of 2009. So okay. end of 2009, started uh, Bizarre Solutions as a, you know, an actual business instead of just sole proprietor or whatever. And um, have grown it from me being a one-man band to, I guess we're at... Uh, 13, no, 12, 13, 14 people now. Nice. Yeah. So Sweet. So tell us a little bit about what Bizarre Solutions does. Obviously yeah. IT, but what does that encompass? Yeah, so what we really like to focus on is, is if I just say IT, most people think, oh, my computer, my servers, or whatever it is, which is true, and we do all that. Okay. But IT's moved past that. Like, you expect when you come in that your computer's going to work. Like, yeah. this isn't Windows 95. This isn't Windows 98. Right. right? Stuff generally works well, right? Yes. Technology is, is fairly reliable for the most part, if you have the right equipment in place. Yes. We'll go a lot of places, and they have cheap routers and other things. Yeah. So, so we do all the IT stuff, and we do all the management and maintenance and all the stuff you have to do to make sure you're good. Uh, but we really focus on cybersecurity. And so okay. that's really what we're pushing into with HIPAA laws, Texas privacy laws, like you kind of mentioned before the show is GDPR, which is European, mm -hmm. but it's going to come here and, if, and, you know, just by the nature of big multinational companies are going to have to comply with it because they do business in Europe. Yes. And all that's going to trickle down into the little businesses they deal with and everything else. And so we focus a lot now on cybersecurity, making sure people's businesses are protected, disaster recovery, backups, you know, that kind of thing, and, and having a plan around technology and not just winging it. Nice. Okay. Sweet. So started off with just you. Now you've got 14 people. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about that journey and, and how you've been able to grow your company and kind of yeah. s the things that you do to be able to accomplish those goals. Yeah. So, you know, being an engineer by training and a nerd at heart, um, like sales isn't necessarily one of those things where I think I'm going to get up and go sell stuff. <laughs> yeah, today, that's, right? Yes. I always say I'm an extroverted nerd in terms of, you know, I can carry on conversation. I'm not I don't know. I guess I, I'm not I want to go home and just sit in front of my computer or whatever, sure. but it's still one of those things you have to push yourself to do. And so, um, you know, that was really it. Like the first year of business, uh, we had some savings and we just reinvested, reinvested, reinvested. Good. Um, and it was probably, I'd have to go back and look, I bet it was two years before we hired somebody. Okay. And, um, and that first year was really building the business and then actually making some money, um, you know, paying, <laughs> paying bills <Yes. laughs> and whatnot. Yes. And uh, I think anybody who's been an entrepreneur, you know, the first year you start a business, Christmas isn't as fun as it was the year, <laughs> the year yeah. before. Yes. You know, because you just know you don't want to spend any, you know, like you just right. got old and. And, um, and so really, you know, it hired somebody and that freed me up to continue to build the business. And, Sweet. and it's one of those things that if you listen to any business podcasts or all the other stuff, they always say work on the business, not yes. in the business. And it's so hard as a little, you know, any small company, right? Even 15, 20 yeah. employees, like you still get pulled into it. Sure. Absolutely. And, and so for me, that was every opportunity I could to work on instead of in the business. And so that was when I hired my first guy. I remember thinking, I can't afford this guy. And then like three months later, it was like, I, I could not afford not, not to, have, to have this, like, because it frees you up to do so much. Yes. And so, you know, that that's basically how we've grown it, right? It's always been organic and, and just, you know, looking for new customers, providing, I think, really good service. Our mm -hmm. turnover rate is extremely low. Like okay. basically every customer we've ever lost went out of business, got acquired, 
Um, you know, there's maybe two or three that decided to do something different. You know, I mean, that's it's just, fantastic yeah, right I mean, there. Like over that's... 10 years to, to have lost very, very few customers. I mean, I think I could count them on one hand, you know, maybe six or seven or something, but you know, and, and a majority of those, like I say, were acquired or something <laughs> else that changed it or went out of business. Um, and so that's it, you know, we just organic growth and just pushing, pushing, pushing and looking for the next step and, and, uh, trying to stay ahead of technology as well, right? Because like I said, yep. 10 years ago, it was, I'll come fix your computer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and then it was, oh, do you have backups? And then, you know, and it just continues to evolve. Sure. And so trying to stay ahead of that. Sure. So what are some things that you do to stay ahead of that? Like trainings or how do you, yeah. what do you, what do you guys do? So a couple of things. So our guys, um, we do a lot of training. Every week we have a training with our guys. Okay. Um, and some of the times that is just knowledge share. So we usually kind of before that, um, the, the kind of help desk guys will say, hey, we've been dealing with this issue or we keep having to escalate this issue to you know, our higher level guys, um, but we think we can do it. So can you guys show us how? And so we'll do a training and, and try to, okay, this is how you configure this or this is how you do that. Um, or if we have a new customer, new software, we might do training on whoever kind of learned it. We'll then train everybody else. Here's, here's the basics of this so that everybody can help them. Um, and then me to try to stay ahead of the curve of technology, like conferences and just seeing what's out there, reading the news and some of the things that, you know, just changes mm -hmm. that are happening there. Um, and then really talking to other IT providers a lot too, right? And so yeah. I'm in a couple of mastermind groups with guys that are running multi-million dollar companies companies in Philadelphia and Jersey and Arizona cool. and talking to those guys as well and what do they see changing in technology and and uh, you know I'm just trying to stay up on it but I would say a lot of its conferences and listening to people because you can see what's happening in the enterprise and know that that's coming to small business in a couple of years or less yeah. depending on what it is yeah it's it's funny people think that things just happen yeah. you know out of the blue but everything's a trickle down kind of trend effect so yeah. if you if you look at typically like you just said if you look at these bigger companies what are they doing now it's most likely going to make its way to the smaller enterprises smaller businesses you know within yeah. a couple of years so, so yeah. like we'll try to stay up to date on what they're doing mm -hmm. because the only thing that's stopping that from coming down the pipe is usually cost yeah so yeah that's just a matter of time and, and distribution and a few other things. Yeah. yeah. And as then mm -hmm. as they bring it down, you know, like next gen antivirus is is they really now call it like endpoint detection and response. Yep. It's AI based and behavior based. And so yeah. it's really it's this new like generation. Some of the traditionally is semantic and you know who it matches sure. those guys. They're incorporating those features, but yeah. this new breed was built from the ground up around. Yes. Here's this new technology we have. Yeah. And so I'm gonna stop have you seen Blackberry's silence? Yes. Okay, yeah. cool. I was just looking yeah. into that the other day. Yeah, so, no, so Silence is really good. Okay. Um, we use Sentinel-1, and okay. they're all, I mean, those are, you know, direct competitors, right? There's uh, CrowdStrike is about to IPO, and they're in that same kind of arena. Okay. Um, there's a few other carbon, well, carbon blacks in the security, but it's, I don't know if it's necessarily full-on endpoint detection response. Gotcha. Um, several companies out of Israel. Israel does a lot really? of technology development, yeah. Really? And um, I'm trying to think of the one, I the, the name is escaping me, but there's a really popular one that's coming out of Israel. And um, and really, what they look at is is the behaviors that viruses, ransomware, and all this new stuff does. And when they see those behaviors, they shut it down. And so, uh, traditional antiviruses they call it dictionary based. And so sure. you and and they have, if you read it, they have advanced heuristics and all this other stuff. But when it was born, it was dictionary based. And so it's looking for bad segments of code, things that they know are bad, and they update it often. Sure. But stuff will get by because yeah, it's a trusted application running a trusted command. It must be okay. Yes. But the new stuff goes, every time that happens, something bad happens next. <laughs> and so we're going to say no. Like, you have to prove that you're, you know, and so there's there's less trust in the newer stuff. Okay. Um, and so it's just, it's an interesting technology. But again, all of that was incredibly expensive when it came out. And they only yeah. wanted to sell to somebody who could have a thousand nodes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've got four computers in your office, you don't have a thousand nodes, <laughs> no, right? You've got four, yeah. And, yeah. and so as... As they got penetration and as it built in the enterprise, they could start to bring that in sure. and create partner programs with you know IT seller, resellers and stuff to nice. to be able to offer that to smaller businesses. So cool, yeah. It's funny that we're talking about that because I literally just saw an ad. I was sitting out in a parking lot the other day and I saw an ad for the Silence one yeah. by BlackBerry and I was like, yeah. "What is this? They've got AI." Because like I knew it was coming.
soon, yeah. but I don't really follow that all the time. So yeah. when I saw the ad show up, I was like, man, we got AI in our antivirus yeah. now. So. It's on my feed all the time since I'm nice. in technology. Like, yeah. I probably see that ad for silence three times a day nice. on Facebook. <laughs> right, yeah, I'm, get, I'm getting retargeted hardcore now that I went and checked it out. I'm get, I see it everywhere. But mm -hmm. yeah, we've been using, we use WebRoot up here. Yep. So I, I've, I've liked it pretty good. But as soon as I saw that, I, I'm, I like to be on the bleeding edge of yeah. technology. So as soon as I saw that ad, I was like, we might be making the switch there because yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's and, free. And WebRoot's good. Yeah. Like it's one that they're really trying to push to incorporate those features. Mm -hmm. um, Sophos is another one okay. that are really trying to incorporate next gen into it, but it's it, it's still just not quite there. Right. It's it's, different... You can tell that it was not built like that, where these yeah. others were like, it was like yeah. they were born into AI. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, nice. that's a, it's, it's when you're born into it versus bolted on, there's just mm -hmm. a difference. And eventually they'll all get smaller and, you mm -hmm. know, and then they'll have the same stuff. But for right now, there's still a definite difference between them. Nice. Well, I'm going to, since we've been talking about it, I like to kind of ask questions based on some answers and stuff. Yeah. But uh, what do you think about AI in general? <laughs> so, it, I mean, I don't think we're going to get Skynet anytime okay. soon. Like, I hope not. Yes. Um, I, you know, <laughs> That's I, the hope and dream, I, right? Yeah, if not, I need to buy more bullets. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I fight off the Terminator. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, AI is incredible in the avenues that it opens up, right? When you start mm -hmm. talking about health and cybersecurity, it's just the, the ability for it to learn and analyze based on patterns is so much faster than what people will do, right? Absolutely. Um, but the other side of that is, um, and it's funny because I was just listening to um, a CD, and it's uh, Nito uh, Cubain, and so he's the, the president of High Point University. Okay. Immigrant came to the U.S. with nothing, and you know now he's chairman of Great Harvest Bread and and uh, I guess BBT and SunTrust maybe or anyways he's going to be you know on the board of a six billion billion dollar bank. I mean like there's six hundred billion. Anyways, the dude's he's been around the block. Nice. And uh, one of the things he was saying is he was talking about you know like you could get fifty or get a machine that would do the work of fifty people. Right, in terms of just sheer output, mm -hmm. but one machine could never really replace one person from a thought process, right? People are just geared different, and we have reasoning and logic that AI will just is so far away from. Sure. That even when it thinks it's good, it still does some weird things. Yes. You know, and, uh, and so I think AI is great. I think it's going to be great for cybersecurity, but the flip side of that is bad guys have access to a lot of the same tools. Mm. And yep. so it, it makes it so you have to continue to think about this, right? You sure. Know, I mean, I think we uh, we kid a lot, but small businesses stick their head in the sand and just say, ah, cybersecurity is not my problem. Yeah. Right. I got antivirus and I have passwords. I'm good. Yeah. And the problem is when you're, you know, the bad guys playing with AI, like it's going to destroy you. It's yeah. Gonna, yeah. It's going to destroy that old school <laughs> antivirus and yeah. stuff. No, that's it. Nice. So, um, but no, AI, I think will be great. I, I think the, the neat part to me is technology advancement that will come around, not sure. specifically cyber, but you know, medical and research, and sure. the fact that can analyze you know proteins and these things mm -hmm. and these huge data sets and draw out conclusions from it mm -hmm. that then researchers can go do. That's the stuff to me that'll be really really cool. Nice, yeah, it's it's kind of it's just making its way into our industry too. We actually had a conversation with a company out of New York about partnering with them. They have a uh, proprietary AI that builds websites. So you go in and you type in a little bit of information about your company and wham, bam, 15 seconds later, you have a concept that an AI yeah. has created. <laughs> and so it's cool. pretty cool, yeah. but they, but kind of to your point where AI is still not quite there as far yeah. as human reasoning and logic is concerned, it, that only gets you about 80% of the way there. Yeah. And then they have like a process, they call it their last 20%. Because yeah. the last 20% has to be designed by their designers in house. So they take yeah. this initially created AI concept and then kind of round it out based on, yeah. you know, real world feedback yeah. from talking to the client and stuff. So. Yeah, because that's the thing. AI will never be good at coming up with sales phrases or yep. that marketing language that will right. draw somebody in for that, that emotional connection right. or whatever. Like, is this you? Yes. <clears throat> and and so, we're not there yet. and Might not ever get there, but it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if we do, then we may have Terminator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, we get, if we get there, that I hope, yes, I hope we have a lot of safeguards in place at that point, but. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. So tell me a little bit about um, some like the cybersecurity stuff that y'all do. Like what did y'all have like certifications or like what what is your what is your like ideal type of cybersecurity that you like to deal with? Like Yeah, so again you have to shoot the line when you're dealing with small business, which is sure. primarily our client, right? I mean kind sure. of five to a few hundred users or whatever because they've got budgets and they can't just say, sure, let's spend a million bucks. Sure. <laughs> 
not right. an AI-based cybersecurity. Right. And so what we really look at is how can we layer in security and and what layers of security can we put in that are cost effective and going to be really good. And so we've actually built, we call it our cyber care policy and, and uh, our cyber care plan. And so we built into that like employee training because you can put millions of dollars into it and then Bob in accounting clicks a link, right? And, and again, it goes, well, this is a trusted person doing a trusted thing. And maybe the new AI-based stuff catches it. Maybe it does. I mean, you just, again, that that's now, you know, the people are always the weakest link or they have, they have a bad password <laughs> yes. and somebody hacks in or whatever. Yes, that's sad. And so we do is. employee training, password portals. We kind of were talking about that beforehand. How do you manage people's passwords and stuff? Okay. Um, you know, the, the next gen, the Sentinel-1, um, dark web monitoring, looking for stolen passwords so you can stay a step ahead of it. Because um, if you know a password's for sale, you can change it and never use it again. If you don't know, then you kind of open yourself wide up to, to get hacked, right? And so there's a set of things that we've built into that that we can really easily go and lay into most any small businesses at a pretty cost-effective way to do. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I mean, it's what kind of router do you have and do you do updates? And that's the simple stuff even that, mm -hmm. that people can do, right? So if you don't want to invest in it or can't, like, have you done your Windows updates? The... I don't know if you remember the WannaCry ransomware. Yeah, we were they just spread. talking about that, yeah. And so it spread, and, and the big damage from that was probably the UK, right? I mean, it was okay. um, it was really aimed at Ukraine, um, and they think that the Russians did it. And it was aimed at Ukraine and trying to disable them. An interesting side note to this is Mondelez, the cookie company that makes Oreo and all mm -hmm. that, they had, uh, I think, $100 million in losses from that. Lord. Because they got all these servers, smoked, and everything else. Zurich is their insurance company. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're not going to cover that because it was an act of war. <laughs> because <laughs> it was Russia attacking the Ukraine cybersecurity-wise. So they're suing Zurich now to get their money to replace all this equipment that they got hooped and downtime and everything else. Jeez. And, uh, yeah, and so it was an interesting thing. But the big problem that most people saw or remembered wasn't necessarily Ukraine and Mondelez cookies or whatever sure. it was was that um, the health system in the UK got basically ground to a halt for a couple of days. Couldn't make appointments, couldn't pull records, couldn't do all the stuff. WannaCry was all based off of a Windows exploit that had been patched for like 18 months. So if people had just done Windows updates, it would have been significantly less destructive, right? And so we yep. go all the time. We went to a customer the other day and they said, oh yeah, everything's up to date. And their server hadn't run updates in four years. Oh Lord. And <laughs> they just thought it was doing it, yeah. right? And, yep. and so that's the stuff that we always see. And it's like, you yep. know, if you can make sure you have Windows updates, if you've got a good password policy, if what policies have you put in place? Um, and I wrote a couple articles on LinkedIn. So if somebody wants to go look me up on sure. LinkedIn, um, and look at the articles I wrote. It's basically how do you accept or how do you um, remove, transfer, reduce, um, or accept risk? And it's all kind of geared around cybersecurity, right? So transfer is cyber insurance. Like, do you have cybersecurity insurance? And then the flip side of that, are you following the policy, right? A lot of people go out and sign up <laughs> for it, and then it says, did you do X, Y, Z? And they go, oh, sure. Well, if you aren't doing that, then it's going to be like Mondelez or whoever, right? They're going to show up. Zurich's going to show up and go, you didn't do those. We're not paying. See you later. And they're yeah. out, right? And uh, so, you know, cyber insurance, how do you avoid risk? How do you train your employees to not click links to avoid risk? And several other things um, that you can do. But, yeah, I mean, I think that's the big thing is is you just, I don't know, it, the Dwight Schrute, you know, from The Office. Yes. He has, in one of the episodes, he's like the greatest advice Michael Scott ever gave him. And uh, he said, well, he once told me, would an idiot do that thing? And if the answer is yes, then I don't do that thing. And so that's always kind of my catchphrase. Like, before you click on it, would an idiot click on it? <laughs> you know? Yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Yeah. Because if you think they do, don't do that. We, we need to get a plaque up in here that says, would an idiot do that? <laughs> like, nice. That's awesome. All right. So being kind of obviously entrepreneur, uh, self-proclaimed nerd, yeah. what are some sources? Like, what are some podcasts or books or yeah. Uh, websites that you like to follow to, to just stay up on not just the tech world but yeah. just entrepreneurism in general like business yeah. ownership but what do you like to do so um, Dave Ramsey's entre leadership group okay um, they've got you mm -hmm. know some Facebook page they put a bunch of stuff I was in that group for a while um, now I'm in one that's more IT focused okay um, but you know, I mean, you have to pay to be, I guess, part of the real entre leadership and do coaching groups and everything else. Um, I think it was worth it, and I think it pushes people to grow. It goes back to everybody talks about, you know, how are you going to work on your business? Do you need coaches to help you, and, and where do you find those? And 
And that that group specifically, um, I feel like, is a fairly reasonably priced way to get coaches and general business advice and a place to go ask questions. And they have a Facebook group. You can, you know, all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I still follow, even though I'm not in the group, I, you know, follow their Facebook, sure. you know, feeds and stuff. Um, uh, Darren Hardy is big with productivity. Yes. Um, I don't know if you know Darren Hardy. Oh, yes, stuff, we do. But mm-hmm. he's got Darren Daily. And so yep. it's a weekly, you know, video that gets delivered in. Um the other ones I've been recently reading is Nito, um, Nito Cubane, who's the president of High Point University. Um, he's just got a lot of books and, and other stuff. And so I actually got to go to a mastermind session with him. It was about 30 people um, at High Point University and him for two days. And uh, they did a deal, you know, if you donated to their scholarship fund or whatever, he sent every CD he's ever recorded and all of his books or whatever. And so we donated to, to get all that. So I've been driving around listening to all the Nito stuff. Nice. Last little bit. I did laugh, though. I don't know how I'm even going to see what's on it. In the box that came, there was a VHS. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Like, I guess I'm never going to see what's on that video. Jeez, <laughs> yeah. This is 1990. Lord. There were several DVDs, like when Condoleezza Rice uh-huh. and a few other you know, people came and, and gave speeches. And so I'll probably watch those. But whatever's on that VHS, I think is going <laughs> to stay, <laughs> stay on that VHS. Nice. Uh, but both of those have been good. Um, or, you know, the Darren Hardy stuff. Um, the other one I would say is um, scaling up Vern Harnish. Let's look at some of okay. his stuff. He's got a lot of really good information out there. Um, and just the book itself, you know, it's kind of how to scale your business. And okay. Do you like, do you follow like The Verge or Tech Crunch or anything like that? You... Yeah, through just usually news aggregation, like sure. you know, Google News or Apple yeah. News on my phone. I'll read the tech news sections of it. The cool. hard part is, is a bunch of those are, you know, like the newest Intel processor and the truth of the matter. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, like when you want to buy a computer, it's uh, unless you're doing CAD or anything else, you want a solid business PC. You, you know, I mean, it's it's not that you got to have bleeding edge. This sure. is you guys, you got to wait six weeks. Intel's releasing a new yes. chip, or you know, that I fall into that category. I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm that kind of guy that waits, yeah. but yeah, most well, and, and I get it, right? Yeah. I mean, if it's your own stuff, but sure. If you're on an accounting firm, you got 20 people, yeah, you just you know, that computer's six years old, so the truth is, replacing it with anything. It's, it's going to be, be better. 15 times faster. Than Absolutely. Now, right? And so, yeah. and you usually get a better deal on mm. the processor that's one generation old or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you don't, you may lose maybe 10% performance or something, but sure. they're probably not maxing it out anyways. Yeah. Um, that's probably one, just thinking of that, is, is one of the big misnomers um, of, of people buying things in terms of technology is bandwidth. We get all the time where people are like, I'm going to go get a gigabit from Suddenlink or from NTS or whatever. And the truth is, one, most websites aren't going to give it to you as fast as you could download. Yes. You're wasting your money. And That's two, like we've got a couple of customers that were, they're just, we need speed, speed, speed. And we went and looked at the router and they're like, I need, I need faster. You know, this router with all the security services only do 250 megs of throughput. And I want to get 500 or a gig. And we look and they're using like 16. <laughs> you know, and you're yeah. like, you don't even need to go faster. Yeah. And, uh. And so look at the upload speeds. Those are you know usually worth it because you're yeah. uploading a lot now. Um, but the truth is you probably don't need gigabit um, unless you're in a totally web-based business. And even yeah. then, it may or may not help you. Yeah, I think we have 200 down and 50 up or something. Yeah, which is plenty, right? Yeah. I mean, you guys, even with video, I would say, are one of the few that could say, well, maybe you could go faster for uploads and other yeah. things. Um, but again, I mean, I think 200 by 50 is everything mission critical you're doing. Yeah. I would imagine it works fine. And yeah. You don't we don't have a given have. day that you're like, Oh, well, with me. <laughs> yeah. As long as, <laughs> as long as suddenly keeps us going, we're, <laughs> yeah. which is, that's a whole nother story for a whole nother time. But that's yes, hour and a half. yes, absolutely. Well, cool. Um, one of, as we've talked about, you know, we have the pre loaded question section. Yeah. So you asked me to ask you about passwords and like, what is a good password? And yeah, so. Tell so, us about that. <laughs> yeah, so historically, right, it was complicated, weird, goofy characters, numbers, letters, uppercase, lowercase, sure. you know, eight or ten digits, and changing every 90 days or every six months. And sure. everybody hated it. The truth is um, people aren't very good at changing things. So when they had to pick a new password, um, A's became ats and ones became exclamations. Mm-hmm. And the password got a one at the end. Or a two at the end. Yep. Or a three at the end, right? I'm guilty. And everybody is, <laughs> yes. right? I'll stand up and do cybersecurity talk <laughs> and laugh because I'll say that and everybody's nodding their heads like, yes, that's that's what we do. And so the new research is actually change your password less often and go for length and randomness. Computers are really bad at random. Like they can't pick random. So if you have unrelated um, characters, they don't, they don't understand it, right? And mm-hmm. so what I tell everybody is put yourself someplace familiar and pick four words. 
So you sit yourself in your office or even in your living room, and you can probably recreate it in your head right now, right? If you're sitting in your living room at home, even though we're in your office, yes. you can probably pick four things off the walls or whatever and say, that's your password. That That is uncanny that you said that because that is literally how I come up with passwords. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and it serves me. It's always served me well. And it's real easy then to get a 16, mm-hmm. 18, 20 digit character mm-hmm. password. It sounds long, mm-hmm. but then when you realize that it's not, there's, I don't know if you've ever seen, there's the XCDC or whatever comic. That's um, not- and it's, you know, stick figure stuff. Anyways, there's a comic and I've used it several times. And it's basically, they pick a password and it's like Troubadour or something and they use special characters and whatever. And they go through how many bits of entropy and how hard it would take to crack it. And then they do horse stapler battery correct. And that is harder to crack, all lowercase, than Troubadour with all the funny characters. And Troubadour with all the funny characters is harder to remember than horse staple battery correct. And and so, you know, he said, and so for them, they came up with some goofy picture of a horse saying, yes, that's correct to a battery with a staple in it, right? And so yes. I, can, I can recreate that in my head. Yes. Even though I haven't seen it and know it's, you know, horse staple battery correct. Absolutely. And... And so you can do the same thing, right? And so, you know, you light, chair, table, what, I mean, yeah. the main thing is to try not to do like everything around your fireplace. Right. Because if, if they try that, you know, when you say screen, poker, mm-hmm. log, you know, that, that's related and a computer may try to run through some of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard a lot of people say dictionary words are bad and I would agree if they're simple and they're not got randomness to the collection of words. Mm-hmm. And so if you do song titles, I can run a database of song titles, no problem. Right. And, and so if you use a song title or a famous movie quote, that's easy to run. That's easy for me to plug into a system and try to hack your password with. But it's a lot harder for me to come up with four random words, stick them together in the right order and hope I get them right. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just probably not ever going to happen. Yeah. You know, and it gets really, really hard. And so then you get length, throw a random, you know, capital in there maybe or and stick a number at the end. But the thing with numbers is everybody does date of birth or a year they graduate high school, you can Google all that stuff, mm-hmm. right? And so like any of your public information is worthless to use because if I really want to hack you and I'm targeting you, I'm going to go search all that stuff and yep. I can find your date of birth probably on Facebook. If I can't, then it's in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And so I can go back and look it up. It's public record. Um, one that is always scares people is go to truepeoplesearch.com and search for yourself. And um, you'll be surprised at all the stuff that comes up. And it's all scraped off public record. Known aliases, last addresses, old phone numbers, known emails. And it's all scraped public record or um, different databases, marketing databases and other things that has all your information. And I don't think people realize, but Facebook probably knows what toothpaste you use. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I tell people often, you know, Facebook knows <laughs> more about you than you probably do about yourself. Only because they can memorize your patterns. Like yeah. the, the mundane... The, things that you think are mundane yeah. if you've got your phone in your pocket they're they're tracking that kind of yeah. stuff so and so yeah here's an interesting one for you so um girl went to target connected to target wi-fi and would walk around target and i don't even know if you have to connect to the wi-fi because they could still triangulate your position mm-hmm. long story short target started sending her advertisements for baby stuff when she had teenage been. girl she knows she's pregnant her family doesn't but because she keeps going to target and walking the baby section target starts advertising to her house which is her parents house with mail for a baby target knew she was pregnant before her parents knew that she was pregnant <laughs> <laughs> welcome to 2019 folks welcome it's, it's, that's so, amazing it's uh that yeah so amazing. i mean that's the kind of data they're collecting right and yeah that's the danger is that when yeah. you're collecting that kind of data yeah. there's you just don't know what's out there yeah and and that makes it easy for me to use family, favorite dog, sports teams, sure. all that stuff. Those are all bad for your passwords <laughs> because it's just easy to find. Yeah. Back the, on that data collection thing, it's I have a love-hate relationship with that because on one hand, it's like, it, you know, if they actually use the data that was collected, like if Facebook really used that to actually yeah. enhance user experience, it could be a really cool thing. Like, yeah. like But they seem to always go and get breached or hacked or something like they can't seem to retain it very well yeah. like if they if they had that part of things on lock and they were able to know what toothpaste I wanted I personally would be okay with yeah. them su- you know suggesting ads so it would just be easy for me to order or whatever yeah. but like that's not what they do with it and yeah. so that's in my mind where the problem is, is cause well, and, and in my mind the problem is when you don't want to know that information yeah you can't go turn it out. off yeah. yeah and so even yeah. like you said earlier is GDPR mm-hmm. So if you've noticed after the past GDPR, so in the last six months yes. to a year, all yeah. these websites pop up. We mm-hmm. use cookies. Blah, 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 I think it was May 25th last year. And yep. all you have is a yes or a no. Yep. 
And if you say no, then the website probably doesn't work right. If you say yes, yes you're agreeing to the terms. Mm -hmm. It was collecting all that data beforehand. Now they're telling you they're collecting data. Mm -hmm. But what would have been a better execution of GDPR was yes, no, let me manage. Mm. Right? And so if I had let me manage, I could say no, 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 or whatever. Right. Because the truth is, all they did was say, hey, did you know we collect a bunch of data? You know, and yeah, it's um, and then they 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 say if you click no, you don't get to experience the site and all its yeah, fullness yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And there was even um, somebody did research. It was just an article that came out. There's something like 5,400 or 6,400 iPhone apps they found that in the middle of the night are dumping data to advertisers. I just saw that. Uh, yeah. I just saw a headline. I didn't click on the article, but it was yeah. Do you know what your iPhone does at night? Yeah. So I, no. I saw the, it was a thought provoking title, but I didn't actually follow it. So yeah. that's what it was. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, there's dumping, and some of them are data collection. You're okay with. True. Sure. Right? Um, because you like Google Apps or, you know, whatever, <laughs> Google Maps and other things. Um, but then a lot of them were dumping data that you didn't realize you were giving up. And so that's the thing I always tell people as well is, one, next time you're sitting there bored on your phone or whatever, just thumb through your apps. If you're not using them, uninstall them. Mm -hmm. Do the same thing with Facebook. Go into the privacy settings. You can see like how many people still probably have Farmville connected to their Facebook. It's oh, collecting data. Lord. And you yes. don't play Farmville anymore. No, right? no Candy, Crush, uh, Candy Crush, anything yeah, like but that. But they're right? collecting that data and mm -hmm. making other revenue streams by selling it. Yep. And so go they got those disconnect that stuff, back right? in the day. That's yep. it. Go, go pull them off because there's just, there's no reason for it. Right? Yeah. And like you said, if... If they were collecting data and you're okay with it, then you're okay with it. Like yeah. I go through mine on, on the iPhone, it's really easy. And I think in the Android, it's pretty easy as well, is you can go turn on like location services sure. on individual apps. And so I'll go through and, and set like the big one for me is American Airlines and then there's the DFW app. And so when I travel for work or whatever, I don't mind when the app is open if it knows where I'm at. It'll tell me where I'm at in the airport, where my gate is, how to get there, where's food. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. But when I'm walking around Nashville or Lubbock, the DFW app, doesn't need to know where I'm at and what I'm doing. Sure. But they'll still collect it if you let them. Yeah, so you're right. going to go turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so okay. I'll turn a lot of those to when I'm using the app, it's okay. The weather yeah. app is the same. Like, I want to open the weather app. I want you to go to where I am at GPS-wise, tell me what's going on, and then when I close it, you don't get to know what I do anymore. <laughs> you know, and, and so if you just change some of those settings, you can restrict a significant amount of data that's out there about you. But the truth is, everything's trying to collect data because there's more money in selling data sometimes than there is selling the product. Yeah, that's, I, and I, I honestly think that's why Facebook, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's where they make their money truly. Is. That's what the Echo's all about yeah. for Amazon, right? Yeah. And Alexa is all about data and, collection. And yes. They, and making it easy to order stuff walking around yes. your house, but it's really about data collection. It's about data collection. And the scary part is, is they have basically come out and said that they keep everything and engineers have access to it that shouldn't. Yes, and I've heard that they have a actual team that is able to listen in. And they do, they listen yes. to it to try to improve Alexa. But where do you have them and what have they heard? So they're hearing yes. fights and all kinds of other things that can be happening. Yep. Else. They did just or are about to release a function where you can say, Alexa, delete everything I said today. And okay. It'll remove that content from their servers. And nice. So okay. Everybody go start telling your Alexa to delete your data. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. So tell me something about uh, two factor authentication and how businesses can, you know, what, first off, how do you feel? Is that like an actual viable thing? We use it yeah. up here. Yeah. Um, and you know, how can businesses, you know, really make use of that? And stuff, yeah. So. so I would say turn on two factor everywhere you can. Yeah, I do. Um, Definitely. They, they did some studies recently and um, in targeted attacks, you can get around it. Two factor is not foolproof. Um, and so even with that, you can fake the keys and other stuff. Sure. But it went from like a 20% success rate trying to hack into somebody's account um, to like a 70, you know, sorry, the other way around. They had 75% success hacking without two factor versus 25% mm -hmm. success hacking when two factor was turned and, on. And that was like them trying to hack that, that thing. That was them trying yeah. to specifically hack a single user account using all of the tools that you would yes. do it, knowing person information, yes. you know, not just a bot stuff. hack, yeah. Yeah, yep. and so active hacking on it. And when it was bots and other things, it went to like 99% effective yeah. and stopping it. And so turn on two-factor everywhere you can, um, especially anywhere you save credit cards and other things mm -hmm. um, because it just makes it harder for somebody to go buy stuff on your card. So mm -hmm. like our Amazon account, bank accounts, all of that should have sure. two-factor. Um, and most places will provide it for free. Yes. There's some places that don't, and there's some companies like Duo and a few others. Um, if you just look for two-factor, I mean, you can Google it or call mm -hmm. us or whatever, but there's several out there that can help you set up paid two-factor for other apps that you might have or whatever the case is. 
Um, but two factor anywhere you can, you should absolutely turn it on because it will help slow down hackers and uh, and can help you stay in control. Email was a big one. Like people don't realize yep. it now, but there's a lot of they'll send phishing emails trying to get passwords or buy them off the dark web. Mm -hmm. And then what they'll do is log in, they'll try to be somebody in a company, CFO or something, and send and ask for wire transfers or money requests or pay, you know people's information. And it happens a lot more than people realize. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to steal money and, and get away with it. And the problem is with stuff like a wire transfer, there's no insurance. You're just hooped. <laughs> yep. You know? yep. so if you don't have, again, if you don't have a policy, if you don't ever do wire transfers, call your bank and say, I never want to do a wire transfer. Turn it off. It's or make it the most complicated you can to approve it, right? That's I need, a I need two different right signatures there. or whatever, right? I got to have a form. I got to be in person in the bank. That's a fantastic yeah. idea. Yeah, I've never really thought about that, but it, like we would never do a wire transfer. I've never done one. I'd yeah. never see a use case for that. So yeah. I should just pick up the freaking phone and call. Yeah, yeah. and just see what nice. they'll do to turn off all those features. Yeah because you just aren't going to use them. So why even make it so somebody could try to pretend to do it? So do y'all deal too much with email, things like that, like DMARC and SPF policies, things like that? Yeah, what do you so, guys do there? Um, so without getting too far into the weeds. Sure, because that can get weedy. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So basically there's a couple of things. So when you set up a mail server, um, if I try to send an email from Micah Bizarre Solutions to your email, mm -hmm. then my email server will ask the internet essentially you know, DNS servers, where's your mail server at? And those are called MX records. And that mm -hmm. gives the location of where your servers are at, right? Yep. At Google or Office 365 or wherever right. in, your, in your office. So it tells it where to deliver to. Then the receiving server will usually do lookups on the backside on DKIM and SPF. And it'll basically say, is this server in the authorized list? Because the email server is typically in a different location or a different provider than the DNS servers. Yes. So the DNS servers are name servers that when you type in Google, it relates the IP address to the name. Right. And, and that's basically how the internet works. And so what happens is email server A sends the email server B. B asks DNS provider, totally separate from that, do these guys have permission? And if, if you don't have SPF records set up, it doesn't stop the transfer, but it gives you a, a potentially higher spammy score. And so you might you have higher odds that ended up in a spam filter. And so um, you want to make sure your DKIM SPF records are set up because it'll yeah. make it so like marketing, sales emails have a better chance of being delivered. Yep. Just business emails have a better chance yes. of being delivered. Um, and the more people that do it, the harder it is for spammers to because end. they can start is infrastructure, you know, kind of global entities that control this stuff can start to enforce stricter and stricter rules. The problem is right now there's a gajillion small businesses that have never heard about it and they went yep. out and set it up on their own and they didn't set it up right. Yep. And if they restrict it, those people would get like, you know, 10% delivery rate sure. or some ridiculous thing. So they have yep. to kind of play to the lowest common denominator. Yeah, I, I asked that because I know there's a lot of people that struggle with emails going to spam, you know, yeah. and if they implemented a couple of those things, yeah. then it would increase their chances that yeah. it goes to the right folder. Like, I've gone in and set it up for us. So yeah. yeah. And you can just Google set up DKM yeah. and set up SPF yeah. and go to your GoDaddy account or wherever you have mm -hmm. your stuff, your domain hosted mm -hmm. and, and set those records up. Yeah. Um, and then you can check that as well. If you use, uh, we use a tool, it's free. It's called MX Toolbox. Okay. Um, and so MX is for mail exchange and sure. toolbox, mxtoolbox.com. And you can do searches for mail delivery and, you know, SPF records and DK and all that stuff. And it'll tell you if your mail servers are on blacklists and all kinds of other stuff. Nice. And so if you're having mail delivery issues, that's a good spot to start. Cool. Yeah. Check that one out for sure. Yeah. Uh, tip or tic-tac-toe time. So, yeah. uh, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, uh, for all y'all listening. We've got a tic-tac-toe board in front of us. So I'm going to ask him the first question is a tip that he has for business owners or entrepreneurs that are wanting to get started or running a business, you know, just what, what's a piece of advice, like a tip yeah. that you wish you had known you've learned along the way? Um, so uh, a couple of things. If you're going to start a business, um, depending on the business and the service in the industry, I would say expect to not get paid for a while. It's a great tip. Right? <laughs> um, I, someone once told me 18 months. Um, we were getting paid before then, but it's because IT is a pretty low cost of entry. Sure. Like, I don't need to buy a lot of equipment. But, like, you guys, if you really want to do good video production, you've got to buy equipment and reinvest. Sure. And so your ramp up time, if you start with minimal, is probably going to be bigger. So I tell everybody, make sure you have enough savings or whatever to not get paid for a little mm -hmm. while. Or a way, maybe you're moving in with parents, or maybe you're just a bachelor. You know, I mean, just make sure you know and understand you might not get a paycheck for a while. Sure. Um, the other thing I, I have said and, and learned, I guess, is that when you feel like 
kind of saying stop and circle the wagons because everything's growing like crazy is usually the exact time to step on the gas. And, mm. and if you do slow down, every time I've done it in business, I can see kind of the trough, right? And it's not that it's really a decline in business, it's really a decline in growth, mm. right? So we've always kind of continued to grow, but instead of growing at you know 20% or 30%, you can you can go look back and go, here's where I decided everything was crazy busy. And I wanted to kind of circle the wagons. And so we, we stopped marketing as much and we stopped mm. knocking on doors as much. And, and then you can see that maybe for a month or whatever, it dropped to 10% or 50 and then it started to go up as you focused on it again. Yep. And, um, that being said, you've got to make sure you balance operational and everything sure. else. Right. I mean, don't grow to the point where you're making all your customers mad and you can't service sure. them and everything. I mean, it, it's healthy growth. This yeah, is always healthy. a juggling act. Yes. But I would say in general, if you feel like I need to step on the brakes for growth reasons, not not the other side, right? If if you're not making money and you can't pay your bills, don't you know figure out that why before yeah, you yes. put a bunch more money in. Yes, yes, absolutely. But if it is, man, we are growing like crazy, and I need to just stop and do everything that you can to keep pushing forward. Gotcha. You know? I mean, and and if that means you work more hours for a short period of time, or sit down with your team if you've got one and say, guys, look. This is where we're at, and so I'm, I'm, we're trying to hire somebody. But if everybody's willing to work 45 or 50 hours, then you know I think it's going to be six or eight weeks. And you'd be surprised that the team usually wants to grow with you. Yeah, right? they're, they're going to step up to the plate. Yeah, yeah they're willing to step up and, and help you through that. Um, yeah. don't abuse your workforce. You know, all sure. that kind of stuff in it. But they'll usually help you through it. Absolutely, especially if they know that there's, there's some an end in sight. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, so. Nice. Cool. I'll let you go somewhere on the board there. Take awesome. Little man. Awesome. And the running joke is that in order for this to be three questions, I have to let you win. So, <laughs> so you, it doesn't really matter where you go. I w I'm going to make a dumb move. Yeah. You can just go straight down the middle. Okay. So that's tick or tip. And then now we got to do tack or tactics. So what is it like a tangible thing that you think people could implement to help them reach their goals? Like what's something that you do? Yeah, so uh, you can do this, I think, at a couple of different levels. Okay. Like I, the Darren Hardy thing, like surround yourself with good people. Okay. And even if that's online people or whatever, but you've gotta have somebody that you can talk to, um, somebody you can talk to about business. Like I've got a buddy of mine that, that's running a business and he'll call me every once in a while, what do you think about, right? And and we'll just talk, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm some crazy business expert, but just being able to talk helps. Yep, absolutely. Right? And, Sometimes and talk, you just got to bounce ideas off. That's yeah. it. To talk to somebody who's kind of in the same boat as you in terms of running the business and responsible for payroll and <laughs> has all that kind of weight. Yes. Because uh, the problem is if you talk to employees about it, they may get the wrong impression. Right? Yes. And and not that it's bad to talk to and you know, be open with staff or whatever, but if you're you know worried about cash flow and you go talk to your employees and say, mm. I'm worried about cash flow for they're, the next 90 days, they're gonna you're like, going to freak them all out. Yes. Right? Getting, yeah. <laughs> there, there's know? a time and a place yeah. and a people to have this That's discussion it, with you know yeah. and so if you have other business owners you go man cash flow we gotta let's talk about cash flow or whatever <laughs> right because cash flow kills that's, business like that's what kills absolutely the business. And, absolutely and but at the same time every business has i guarantee it, every business i mean has always had a point where they said if i don't get x dollars by x date i can't pay people mm -hmm. right and and uh, unless they started with gobs of money or whatever mm -hmm. but even then they probably did i mean fedex i don't know the truth of it but the story is he couldn't make payroll took all his money to vegas and gambled it won enough money to make payroll went back and fedex continued and if he hadn't done that fedex would have died <laughs> that's <know>? awesome <laughs> i haven't heard that story yeah. that's and, awesome though and and so surround yourself with with people and if that get it and maybe if you don't right i mean you're starting a business and you don't know a lot of business owners mm -hmm. one you probably find some people if you go and talk to them but get involved in networking groups um, you know, go look at things like Darren Hardy or whatever that mm -hmm. is that daily tip of the day yep. that you can kind of do because that's the stuff that will give you more information and that's will awesome. give you more tactics. So get that framework as your first tactic and then you can get the other tactics beyond that, you know, because you could say all the things, right? You know, pick one thing you're going to do today and yeah. work on important, not urgent. And, you know, there's all that stuff. Sure. But first, you got to get the infrastructure set up. But first, you got to. And, and the problem is once you figure out the first one, what's next? And so unless you strive for that continual learning mm -hmm. mentorship um, and, and drive to do more, then you'll master the one or two you heard. And then now what? Yep. So you always want to be pushing that. Nice. Cool. Well, I'll let you. I'll just. I'll go simple. Boom. We'll just go in a straight line. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Last one. Toe or total domination. So, what are you doing to like totally dominate in your industry or in your personal life or just just whatever? What's something that you're doing to like set you up for massive success? Yeah. So I. I mean. 
You just got back from Italy. Okay. And, and I feel like people in America in general don't take enough time to do. Right? And so um, this may sound cliche or whatever, but what was it? I just saw something. Virgin is launching a new cruise line. Okay. And they have somebody from every state except South Dakota. So they're taking out all these ads in South Dakota to try to get somebody to book on a maiden voyage or whatever. And anyways, in the article, it said that South Dakota, on average, takes 4.3 days of vacation a year. And, like, you have to recharge. And you have to make sure you don't burn yes. out. And so it isn't go to Italy as much. I mean, like, we were able to do that. We found cheap airfare and some other stuff. Sure. And it was great. Um, but I, I think... Taking that time to relax, realize when you need to to stop and and circle the wagons and mentally um, to continue to push forward, so you can continue to have your foot on the gas. Right? Absolutely. And and so I think that's one of the things that I've always tried to balance. And it's hard for me because if I have these days, like I feel like sometimes I'm out of the office a lot, right? And traveling, and I got work and appointments, and you know, like this mm-hmm. or whatever. And then I want to take another couple of days to go do something that's just me time. And there's part of me, it's like, man, everybody probably thinks I'm gone all the time. Yeah. You know, because this culture in America is you have to do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be there eight hours and you have to do everything else, even though you get the work done in a shorter amount of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so trying to spread that even to our staff, um, our higher level engineers, we're doing uh, four 10-hour days. We're going to try that where they just rotate one one week a month. They're going to do four 10-hour days, and so they get a three-day weekend. Then we'll see how that goes, and can we expand it to two of them off at a, you know, in a week or whatnot. The hard part is the nature of our business is we have to stay staffed for everybody else. Sure. So even if we can get the work so done in four days. So you can have that 24-hour. That's it. I can't take Friday off for the whole the, you know, office and just say, well, we'll get to your problem on Monday. Yes. Right? You yeah. Know? You got to have somebody there. Yeah. And so we can't necessarily you know thin the team out too much, but we're, gonna, we're trying to find ways of how do we make sure that people have a little bit extra time. And even though they're still working 40 hours, it's just that it extra up day bit. makes it so you've got three days and it's a little more downtime and time to kind of unwind. And That's, you know. that's fantastic. That's a great yeah. idea. So we're going to try to do it. So we're trying to push some of those things. But I, I think that um, too often people get burned out. And so that's one of those things that I'm, I'm trying to that's awesome. do personally and push into the business. And cool. say, like, how do we make sure that people feel like if they need the time, they can take the time, nice. you know, and, and uh, have a little time off here. Because if the truth is, if it's scheduled and all the other stuff and they understand, hey, we got a big project, so, you know, on vacation next week, not this week or whatever. Yeah. Again, most people are able to, to work with you. And yeah. so, you know, we all kind of kid, like I, I tell everybody, there's there's vacation guidelines, like you've been here for X amount of year, you know, years, you get X weeks of vacation. But really, we just, if you need vacation, take it. Mm-hmm. We don't track it. We don't care. Yeah. It's in there. So if somebody is abusing it, we can go back and say, okay, this is where you should kind of be. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were gone for two months, man. You were gone for two months. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that's the thing you know, nice. that I'm, I'm trying to do to, to make sure I've got the energy and reserves to go kill it every day. Sweet. I'll let you. Boom. You won. Oh, that's wow. That's surprising. Game of so right surprising. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, cool, sir. I'll uh, roll out the red carpet for you. You tell me what you guys got going on. What's the cool things yeah. on the horizon? Yeah. So um, a couple of things. One, um, we're working on um, a couple of neat little kind of packages for retail. We'll hopefully roll okay. those out soon, but we're hoping to flesh them out. Knowing that retail is usually pretty cost sensitive. Uh-huh. Um, and so I'm hoping that we'll have those rolled out soon. Um, our cybersecurity policy, I think, is a really, really cool deal that we're rolling that out um, because I just... I, Everybody needs it, even if they don't know that they need it. Mm-hmm. You know, like they, really every business down to, you know, if you're a one-man band, if you have customer records, people want to steal your stuff. Yep. And uh, and so everybody needs cybersecurity and, mm-hmm. and training and all the other stuff. And so we kind of had that cyber care, tried to get it at a price point that was pretty feasible for people, um, but easy to roll out. Um and then, uh, really, man, I think we're you know we're gonna do some remodeling in our office and because cool. we're growing and and uh, you know I don't know I mean I guess I could go on and on about you know bizarre solutions and what we do and everything sure. else but I don't think people probably want to listen to all of that so <laughs> I'd say go check out our website yeah plug uh, your website where can they, where can they find you yeah it's bizarresolutions.com. dot com okay. follow us on Facebook and, and LinkedIn and okay um, you know we have a weekly tech tip if they want to get on that weekly Sweet. tech tip list shoot me an email at mike at bizarre solutions um, dot com and uh, you know we can add you to the weekly tech tip list and um, I don't know I mean I really I just I wish people took cybersecurity serious in their business and sure. even at home and, yeah uh, you know because it just needs to be it shocks me because I mean I I feel like we take it pretty seriously up here like yeah. I've I've been 
been doing like SSL certificates on websites yeah. since before that became a mainstream yeah. thing. Like I've done two factor authentication since yeah. before that was a mainstream thing. Like I, I consider myself an early adopter of some yeah. of these security policies, but it shocks me to see the amount of people that just simply do not care. Yeah. So yeah. It's, and like, it's amazing to me. Yeah. I think what scares me the most is when we go in and talk to people and they go, ah, oh, we don't care. Yeah. It's you like, know, no, we had, bro, you're going to care. We had a company in town, um, and I won't say their name, sure. but, um, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we sent them a list, you know, I said, Hey, we have this new cool service where we can monitor the mm -hmm. dark web for stolen credentials. I ran yours. You've, you know, like you got it on there, the man. owners of the company have it on here. Oh, There's Lord. Three or four, like this is, you guys need to pay attention. And they were just like, we're fine. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't think you understand. Yeah. Like, I could go the dark this web. right now <laughs> yeah. and I could go log into all of your accounts and hack all your stuff. Like you, yeah. you don't, you don't want this out there. And yeah. like, eh, we're good. I'm like, all right, well, Hopefully you'll go change those passwords. Yeah, faster, but, you jeez. Know. Yeah, yeah, I just you know everybody thinks nobody wants to hack me. I just have name and address, and that's public information or whatever. But you know mm. the, the privacy laws are getting tighter, mm -hmm. and um, and as they get adopted, like Arizona just to passed a big one. Texas has a privacy law, and they've updated it in the last few years. Um, but if you basically have two or three identifiable pieces of information and it's leaked, you have to notify end users, and you could be fined up to a few dollars a record. Um, I forget what it is. It's, you know, ten or ten or a hundred dollars a record, but it's up to like ten grand a day and up to two hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars, depending on your business. <laughs> and so, if that happens, and you know it all about it, and you get this big fine, most businesses, at even at two hundred fifty grand, at the low end of that, even at a hundred grand, would just it just put you out of business. Yeah, bye close bye. Your doors and go home. Peace out. You yep. know, and and it's only going to get worse because you look at all the stuff that's happened at Facebook and that's happened, mm -hmm. you know, all these big data breaches and. And Congress is going to start passing laws. Yep. And it's going to be something. Kind of you're either going to have to react to it or go, we're covered already. Yep. And you're better off saying we're covered already. Absolutely. Be preemptive with this kind of stuff, not yeah. reactive. No, nice. That's it. Exactly. Cool. Well, thank you for your time, man. I yeah. think this is a good one. And if you're a business owner out there listening to this, Take your uh, take your data security seriously because yeah. that could be the unsung thing that undoes your company. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining us. We'll catch you next time.